The title of this talk is An Approach to the Neonate with Neurological Findings. The key word in this title is neonate. A neonate, in the context of this talk, is a patient between birth and 30 days of age. The word neonate is important because it implies an age group in which the frequency of the types of neurological findings, pathological processes, and etiological conditions differ from any other age group. Another important word in this title is approach. This is so because the purpose of this talk is to provide you with an algorithm that will help you analyze a neurological finding in the neonate and conclude what its cause is. And the last important words in this title and the point of departure for this talk are neurological findings. Let us then start this talk by saying that once a neurological finding is detected in a neonate, the challenge is to determine what is causing it. It is universally agreed that this challenge is best met by having a well-organized approach. What is not universally agreed upon is how this organized approach should be organized. During this talk, as I just mentioned, when going through the important words in the title, I will put forward an approach in the form of an algorithm, surely not the perfect approach, nor the perfect algorithm, but one that I have found useful and I hope that you will find it useful too. I call this algorithm the neurological order of operations. I call it the neurological order of operations because it reminds me of the mathematical order of operations that I learned while going through high school. So how is the neurological order of operations organized? I organize the neurological order of operations in five steps. I will initially introduce to you these steps in the form of five simple questions. The first question is which pathway is involved? The second question is, where is the pathway involved? The third question is, what are the mechanisms involving the pathway at the selected site? The fourth question is, what are the causes producing the involvement? And the fifth and final question is, what is the most likely cause of the neurological finding. Now that we have listed the five steps in the form of questions, I will go on to answer them in the context of a neurological finding. We start with a neurological finding. We ask ourselves which pathway is involved. By answering this question, we determine the neurological functional system involved. Then we ask ourselves the next question, where is the functional system involved? The answer to this question will yield the anatomical localization of the lesion producing the neurological finding. Next, we ask ourselves what are the possible mechanisms producing the involvement of the given functional system at the selected site. The answer to this question will lead us either to conclude that the neurological finding does not represent a pathological manifestation, in which case no further analysis is needed, or the answer to this question will lead us to formulate a list of possible pathological processes producing the neurological finding. This list will constitute the pathological differential diagnosis. Next, we ask ourselves what are the possible causes of the pathological process producing 
the neurological finding. The answer to this question leads us to formulating a list of possible causes. This list constitutes the neurological differential diagnosis. And finally, we ask ourselves, what is the most likely cause of the neurological finding? We answer this question by choosing from the neurological differential diagnosis the one cause we think most likely to be producing the neurological finding. It is important to stress that the purpose of this algorithm is not to determine what is wrong with the patient, but to determine what is causing the neurological finding. So let us now talk about the neurological order of operations in more details. The starting point, as it was just mentioned, is the neurological finding. The types and frequency of neurological findings encountered during the neonatal period is one of the factors that distinguishes neonates with neurological diseases from older patients with neurological diseases. Most neurological findings in neonates are due to a few root causes. They consist of loss of a motor function, such as arm weakness, an excess in motor function, like repetitive jerks, the liberation of normally inhibited motor function, such as tonic postures, or are the consequence of ill-fated compensations, like repetitive blinking while sucking a bottle. It is important to stress here the point that I have briefly mentioned just a few minutes ago, when I was listing the steps in the order of operations. This point is that normal neurological activity in neonates is rather frequently misinterpreted as pathological. This situation forces us to initially consider all neurological findings as pathological until the lack of association with a pathological process is determined. I will not dwell on this point at this junction any further, but I will address this issue more thoroughly a little later in the talk while discussing about pathological differential diagnosis of, of neurological findings. For now, I will continue talking about neurological findings in general without distinguishing pathological neurological findings from normal neurological activity misinterpreted as pathological. So going back to the root causes of neurological findings, it is important to know that although in theory there could be many different neurological findings in neonates, the actual number of different neurological findings that we encounter in, neonate, in the neonatal period is rather small. In the following frames, I will present to you a list of the most common neurological findings in this age group. The most frequent neurological findings in neonates are hypotonia, weakness and jerks, arthrogryposis. These neurological findings may involve one limb, both arms, both legs, four limbs, or same side limbs. In cases of weakness, based on its distribution, we talk about monoparesis, diparesis, paraparesis, quadriparesis, or hemiparesis respectively. If instead of weakness, the patient is paralyzed, the postfix paresis is substituted by pigia. Other neurological findings of frequent presentation in neonates are swallowing difficulties, sucking difficulties, abnormal gaze, anystagmus, tosis, inability to close eyelids, repetitive eye blinking, unreactive pupils, midriasis, meiosis, 
apnea, mouth twitching, and lower quadrant facial weakness. It is important to mention that when a neonate presents with more than one neurological finding, we have to choose from among them one to be used as the leading neurological finding. It is this leading neurological finding that drives the neurological order of operation. So, once we have selected the neurological finding that will drive the order of operations, we begin to follow the steps depicted by the arrows in this algorithm. The first step is to find the pathway involved. That is, to determine the neurological functional system involved. I define a neurological functional system for the purpose of this talk as a chain of neurons here represented by three neurons terminating in a muscle and serving a specific purpose such as opening the eyes wider. It is the analysis of the neurological findings that will reveal the involved neurological functional system. Hence, I will mention each neurological functional system in relation to their neurological findings. I will start with ne the neurological finding and then name the appropriate neurological functional system. I will do it this way to draw your attention to their intimate relation. So, I assign all the neurological findings listed here, which I encourage you to read on your own, to involvement of the corticospinal system, swallowing difficulties to involvement of the swallowing system, sucking difficulties to involvement of the sucking system, abnormal gaze and nystagmus to involvement of the gaze system, ptosis, repetitive blinking and inability to close the eyelids to involvement of the eyelid system, unreactive pupils, mediasis and meiosis to involvement of the pupillary system, apnea to involvement of the breathing system, and mouth twitching and lower facial quadrant weakness to involvement of the pouting system. So, as you can see, this step going from a neurological finding to the neurological functional system does not require extensive memorization, merely intuition and common sense. Once we have determined the functional system involved, we take the next step. The next step is to ask ourselves where is the functional system involved. Answering this question should lead us to the anatomical localization, that is, to localize the neurological finding to a specific site within the neurological functional system. Going from the neurological functional system involved to the anatomical site affected, that is, anatomical localization demands that we have a preconceived model of the different areas of the nervous system. In the next few minutes, I will provide you with a simple way to compartmentalize the nervous system that applies to all neurological functional systems. I encourage you to memorize this division because during the course of this talk, we will use these areas as the major anatomical sites for localization. Any neurological functional system may be affected at the level of the brain. In the brain, we can distinguish the cortex, here represented in one hemisphere only, the centrum semiovale, and the internal capsule. A neurological functional system may also be involved at the level of the brainstem. In the brainstem, we distinguish the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. 
neurological functional system may also be involved at the level of the cerebellum, at the spinal cord, or at the lower motor neuron. It is important to recognize that there are lower motor neurons in the spinal cord. They are found in the anterior horn and in the lateral horn, and that there are also lower motor neurons in the brainstem. In the brainstem, the lower motor neurons are scattered in discrete nuclei. A neurological functional system may also be involved at the level of the nerve, in which case the site involved may be the axon or the myelin. Nerve involvement may also occur in different types of nerve. The types of nerve are somatic nerve from the spinal cord, somatic nerve, nerves from the brainstem. For the sake of clarity, I will include the branchial nerves among somatic nerves. Other nerve types include parasympathetic nerves from the brainstem, sympathetic nerves from the spinal cord, and parasympathetic nerves from the spinal cord. Another area of possible neurological functional system involvement is the neuromuscular junction. At the neuromuscular junction, the site involved may be the presynaptic region, which belongs to the nerve and releases acetylcholine in all, in all nerve endings at the junction or at the postsynaptic region, which belong to the muscle. The postsynaptic region has nicotinic receptor in somatic muscles and muscarinic receptors in sympathetic and parasympathetic muscles. And finally, a neurological functional system may be involved at the level of the muscle. The muscle involved may be striated, smooth, or both. Now that we have determined the areas to which to localize the pathological process within a, neuro a neurological functional system, I'd like to tell you about the nuts and bolts of anatomical localization. But before I do that, I will take a moment to mention an English Franciscan friar, William of Auckland. I think no scholar contributed more to neuroscience than this Franciscan friar. His major contribution to neuroscience was one statement. Plurality is not to be posited without necessity. This statement has come to be regarded as the principle behind what is now called Ockham Razor. You can see in this picture, pointed by the arrow, an indication of his dictum and read by the side of the image one translation of his famous quote. Neuroscience has utilized this dictum to imply the following. What can be explained with one lesion should not be explained with two. And what you can explain with a small lesion should not be explained with a large one. Having said this, in the next few minutes, I will provide you with a relatively simple process aimed at achieving anatomical localization. The first and the most important item when trying to reach anatomical localization is to know the trajectory of all the functional systems. As you can imagine, knowing the trajectory of all the neurological functional system listed here is a strenuous endeavor that would require a lecture for each of them. I will nevertheless provide you with a simple description of each of these systems. Probably the best known of the neurological functional system is the corticospinal system. 
The corticospinal system can be described as a two motor neuron system. This terminology is based on the site of origin of the multitude of neurons that constitutes the corticospinal system. So, we talk about the corticospinal system as having a first motor neuron and a second motor neuron. The first motor neuron is in the cerebral cortex and it is called the upper motor neuron. The axon of this neuron travel through the centrum semiovale, the internal capsule, the brain stem and the spinal cord to make contact with the second motor neuron. The second motor neuron is at the level of the contralateral anterior horn in the spinal cord. This neuron sends its axon to form nerves. These nerves end in the neuromuscular junction which, as their name indicates, establish the contact between the nerve endings and the estriated muscles. This arrangement is very similar, that is, there is a first motor neuron and a second motor neuron in the swallowing system, in the soaking system, and in the pouting system. The major difference between this, the corticospinal system and these three systems is that their lower motor neuron are in the brainstem instead of being in the spinal cord. The other systems are a little more complicated. The breathing system has two components, a voluntary component and an involuntary component. The voluntary component is similar to the corticospinal system, the first motor neuron being in the cortex and the second motor neuron in the contralateral anterior horn of the spinal cord, but only at the level of the cervical spine. The involuntary component of the breathing system is different from the corticospinal system. The involuntary component is different because the first motor neuron, here represented in yellow, is in the brain stem. It's a lateral to the second motor neuron. The second motor neuron of the involuntary component of the breathing system is at the same location as the second neuron of the voluntary component of the breathing system. In the anterior horn of the spinal cord at the level of the cervical spine. The gaze system can be viewed as a three neuron system. The first neuron is at the cerebral cortex. The second neuron is in the brain stem. The purpose of this neuron is to coordinate the right and left eye extraocular movements. And the third neuron is also in the brain stem. The purpose of this neuron is to execute the extraocular eye movements. The eyelid system has three components, each with a different arrangement. The component of the eyelid system that closes the eyelid has two motor neurons. This component of the eyelid system is similar to the swallowing, sucking, and pounding systems except for a twist. The twist is that instead of one first motor neuron, there are two first motor neurons, one in each cerebral hemisphere cortices. Both of these motor neurons make contact with the second motor neuron in the brainstem. Thus, the second motor neuron receives its lateral and contralateral signals from the brain. The muscle the second motor neuron innervate is the orbicularis oculi. This muscle is an estriated muscle. The orbicularis oculi is in the upper and in the lower eyelid. The second component 
of the eyelid system lifts the upper eyelid. Lifting the upper eyelid is also accomplished by a two motor neuron system, similar in configuration to the swallowing, sucking and pouting systems. The first motor neuron is in the cortex, the second motor neuron is in the contralateral brain stem, the axon from this neuron innervates the levator palpebrae. The levator palpebrae is an estriated muscle that is found in the upper eyelid only. The third component of the eyelid system is quite different from all the system we have so far described. It is different because the muscle it innervates is a sympathetic smooth muscle. In this component of the eyelid system, the first neuron is in the hypothalamus, the second neuron is in the spinal cord at the level of the lateral horn of the first thoracic spinal segment, and the third neuron is in the superior cervical ganglion. This neuron is the one that innervates the muscles of Mueller in the upper and lower eyelids. The function of the muscle, muscles of Mueller is to raise the superior eyelid and to lower the inferior eyelid, thus widening the eye aperture. The last functional system we are going to consider is the pupillary system. The pupillary system has two components, one that makes the pupil smaller and the other that makes the pupil bigger. The component of the pupillary system that makes the pupil smaller has the first neuron in the midbrain and the second neuron in the ciliary ganglion. The second neuron innervates the constrictor of the pupil. This component of the pupillary system is only influenced by light. It, be, it belongs to the parasympathetic nervous system. The second component of the pupillary system, the one that makes the pupil bigger, is similar to the sympathetic component of the eyelid system, the one that innervates the muscle of Mueller. In the pupillary system component that makes the pupil bigger, the first neuron is in the hypothalamus, the second motor neuron is in the spinal cord at the level of the lateral horn of the first thoracic spinal segment, and the third neuron is in the superior cervical ganglion. The neuron in the superior cervical ganglion innervates the dilator of the pupil. The action of this component produces, as you can imagine, dilatation of the pupil. Next, once we know the trajectory of the functional system involved, it is also of paramount importance that we know the different clinical manifestations produced by similar lesions at different locations within each neurological functional system. For example, a small corticospinal lesion in the centrum semiovale, here represented by the red blob, is likely to produce a restricted motor deficit because at this location, the centrum semiovale, the axons from the upper motor neurons are spread through a wide area. On the other hand, the same le size lesion in the internal capsule where all the axons of the upper motor neurons are bunched together will produce a more extensive deficit. Sadly, all we need to know to find the anatomical localization of a lesion does not end here. In addition to knowing the functional system trajectory and the different clinical manifestations produced by similar lesions at different levels 
of a functional system, it is also important to know the findings that arise from the involvement of structures adjacent to the trajectory of the ne neurological functional system being evaluated. The findings produced by involvement of the adjacent structures include manifestations brought about by the involvement of other neurological functional systems. For example, involvement of the corticospinal system, the gaze system, and the parasympathetic component of the pupillary system, as manifested by the presence of hemiparesis in conjunction with contralateral dilated pupil and lateral eye deviation, indicates a midbrain lesion. And finally, regarding involvement of the adjacent structure, it is also important for anatomical localization to consider the manifestation brought about by involvement of adjacent non-neurological anatomical structures. Involvement of these structures produces non-neurological findings that also contribute to anatomical localization. This frame shows an example of the later. We can see in this patient a mass behind his right ear. This patient had a facial had facial weakness on that side. In this case, the location of the mass suggests compression of the facial nerve at the level of the parotid gland as the cause for the patient's facial weakness. So, to summarize the procedure for anatomical localization, I will repeat the four items we must know to successfully localize a lesion. One, the trajectory of the neurological functional system. Two, the regional difference within a functional system as it pertains to their clinical manifestations. Three, the manifestation produced by involvement of adjacent neurological functional system. And four, the manifestations produced by the involvement of adjacent non-neurological structures. After anatomical localization, the third step, as you can see in this chart, the one signaled by the aqua arrow is a very complicated one. It starts by considering all the pathological mechanisms capable of producing a neurological finding at a given anatomical location, regardless of the age, and ends in one of two ways. Either by concluding that we are dealing with a benign event that requires no further workup, this conclusion is attained if all pathological processes initially considered are excluded. In this case, no further consideration of that particular neurological finding is needed. Or it may end up by formulating a comprehensive but short list of the most likely pathologic processes capable of producing the neurological finding being considered. Formulating such a list demands that we again take notice that we're dealing with neonates. As we have pointed out before, the pathological processes that affect the neonate are different from those affecting older patients. The pathological processes or basic mechanisms of diseases that we need to strongly consider in neonates are seizures, trauma, metabolic disorders, vascular events, error of metabolism, infectious processes, autoimmune diseases, tumors, degenerative disorders, and malformations. It is important to recognize that this list has two limitations. The first limitation is that it is not all-inclusive. The second limitation is that it is capricious. From reading 
this list, it is clear to all of us that the presence of one pathological process does not exclude others in the list. For example, seizures do not preclude a tumor, nor does a vascular event preclude a metabolic disorder, such as hypoglycemia. Nevertheless, from a practical point of view, I have found this list of pathological processes helpful, and it is for this reason that I am including it here despite its limitations. Now that we have named the pathological processes that often occur in neonates, the next challenge in developing a pathological differential diagnosis is to determine how likely are each of the pathological processes just mentioned to occur at the different anatomical sites. In the following minutes, I will introduce a colorful table that highlights the frequency of the different pathological mechanisms involved in the production of neurological findings based on anatomical localization. We will start with a simple figure to which we will be progressively adding features. In this frame, I am presenting a cartoonish representation of the nervous system. The different regions of the nervous system would be pointed out by the use of color arrows. We have the brain, brainstem, cerebellum, spinal cord. It is important to mention that although the arrow is placed pointing to the cervical spinal cord, the arrow is meant to indicate a lesion at any segment of the spinal cord. Next, we have the lower motor neuron, nerve, neuromuscular junction, and muscles. It is also important to emphasize that for the sake of clarity, the cranial nerves, lower motor neurons, nerves, neuromuscular junctions, and muscles are not represented in this figure. Nevertheless, their pathology will be considered simultaneously with the pathology of the spinal nerves. The color squares are just introduced below the cartoon, as you can see, matches the color arrows, implying specific areas of the nervous system previously mentioned. I will indicate the frequency of the different pathological mechanisms by a large X when frequent, a small X when less frequent, and an empty space when rare. I will now introduce to this figure the pathological processes that we have just mentioned as frequently occurring in neonates. And they are seizures, trauma, metabolic disorders, vascular events, error of metabolism, infectious processes, autoimmune diseases, tumors, degenerative diseases, and malformations. I now will go ahead and indicate the frequency of each pathological processes at each location. In, in a neonate with a neurological finding originating from the brain, the pathological processes that should be strongly considered are seizures, trauma, metabolic disorders, vascular events, error of metabolism, infectious, infectious processes, tumors, and malformations. Degenerative diseases are less likely and autoimmune diseases are rare. Having talked about the neurological findings originating from the brain, I will now list those originating from the brainstem. 
By far, the most common patholo pathology I have encountered at these sites at this site are malformations, metabolic disorders, vascular events, errors of metabolism, infections, tumors, and degenerative diseases are less common. I do not recall ever seeing a patient with brainstem trauma, seizures, or autoimmune diseases. In a neonate with neurological findings originating in the cerebellum, the pathological processes to consider include seizures, vascular events, infectious processes, tumors, and most of all, malformations. In neonates with neurological findings originating from the spinal cord, the most frequent pathological processes are malformations and trauma. Less likely, they are due to vascular events or tumors. Next, we will discuss the neurological finding produced by lower motor neuron involvement. In this cartoon, lower motor neurons are wrongly presented at the spinal cord, but as previously mentioned, lower motor neurons are also present in the brainstem. The list that follows include pathological processes affecting the lower motor neuron at both sites. Degenerative disorders are the most frequent pathological process affecting the lower motor neuron. Error of metabolism and malformations are less frequent. The next site of the nervous system we will consider is the nerves. Nerve lesions in ne the neonate may be focal or diffuse. Focal lesions present with regional deficit, like a wrist drop. Diffuse involvement lead to generalized hypotonia. The most frequent focal pathological process involving nerves in the neonate is trauma. Nerve malformations may affect one nerve or all the peripheral nervous system. Nerve tumors are infrequent. Autoimmune diseases are also infrequent. Next, we will consider the neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction pathology includes malformations. Malformations may affect the presynaptic, junctional, or postsynaptic region. Autoimmune diseases and infrequently one infectious process that is botulism. Next, we should consider muscle pathology. Muscle pathology during the neonatal period is usually due to degenerative disorders or malformations. Error of metabolism involving the muscles are infrequent in this age group. Tumors are also infrequent. I think that by looking at this table, we can easily visualize the importance of anatomical localization as an effective tool to reduce the number of pathological processes that should be considered at the different anatomical sites. I think that this table also highlights that anatomical localization to certain sites have a stronger impact on reducing the number of pathologies to be considered than at other sites. When confronted with such a situation where anatomical localization only minimally reduces the number of pathological processes to be considered, or even when the number of pathological processes under consideration is significantly reduced by anatomical localization, 
It is often useful to use the clinical initial course of the neurological finding as another filter to further reduce the number of pathological processes being considered. The initial course is here being defined as the time from when the neurological finding is first noted to the time it reaches its maximal severity. The initial course is a valuable tool reducing the number of pathological processes to be considered at each anatomical site, but in neonates it has two very important limitations. One limitation common to all pediatric age groups is that we rely on adults' observation to establish the onset and evolution of a neurological finding. The second limitation is unique to neonates. The neonate has just spent several months beyond our prying eyes inside the uterus. Hence, a pathological process with a short or relatively short initial course occurring at any time during intrauterine life may appear as a fixed deficit at birth. For this reason, it is very important to keep in mind that the static course of a neurological finding, when this finding is already present at birth, cannot be taken to exclude any pathological process based on its initial course. For the same reason, the progression of a neurological finding already noted at birth has to be judiciously interpreted before using its course as a filter. Having said this, I will go on to discuss the use of the initial course as a filter in the process of reducing the number of pathological processes being considered to a manageable list that will constitute the pathological differential diagnosis. I will again use the same exercise I used to introduce the frequency of pathological mechanisms in relation to anatomical localization. I will start with a simple figure and progressively add to it items to help us visualize the contribution of the initial course to the pathological differential diagnosis at the different anatomical sites. In the y-axis of this figure, the arrow indicates severity. The x-axis indicates time. Time is given in minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, and years. In all the frames, the word neonate will be a constant reminder that we're only talking about neonates. The specific area in consideration will be expressed by the side. And under the timeline, I will introduce the pathological processes. So let's start with the brain. When a neurological finding that originates from the brain of a neonate has a very quick initial course, that is, when from the time it is first noted to the time it reaches maximal severity is a matter of seconds as it is indicated by the red line we just introduced. Three pathogenesis are most likely seizures, trauma and metabolic disarrangement such as hypoglycemia. When a neurological problem originating from the brain of a neonate has an initial course that reaches its peak in a matter of a few minutes instead of a few seconds, in addition to seizures, trauma and metabolic diseases, we need to consider a vascular pathology. When a neurological finding that originates from the brain of, of a neonate progresses in a matter of half an hour to an hour, 
we must consider as the most likely pathogenesis vascular event such as intracranial bleeding but it also may indicate an inborn error of metabolism a slightly longer initial course of the neurological findings that is one progressing over a matter of several hours should make us think of an error of metabolism but also of the possibility of an infectious process. Neurological findings with an initial course of a few days to a week suggest similar pathological processes as those that we had just mentioned. An error of metabolism or an infectious process. Neurological findings originating from the brain of a neonate with an initial course of over one or two weeks should make us consider tumors in addition to inborn error of metabolism and infectious processes. The initial course of a neurological finding originating from the brain of a neonate that appears to progress throughout the neonatal period and does not settle at the end of this time may indicate an inborn error of metabolism, an infectious process, a tumor, or a degenerative process. Finally, a neurological finding originating from the brain of a neonate present at the time of birth that does not change over the neonatal period is likely to be a malformation. But it is important to recognize, as I mentioned before, that a pathological process with a brief initial course at any time during pregnancy or delivery, or even those pathological processes with a long initial course, if they occur early enough in pregnancy, may become stable while the fetus is still in utero. These situations will nullify the value of the initial course as a relevant filter to reduce the number of pathological processes when the neurological finding is noted at birth. This concept that we are mentioning here in the brain is also true for the analysis of pathological processes at other anatomical sites. Now, I'd like to move from the brain to the brainstem. Neurological findings produced by a brainstem abnormality having a brief clinical course of a few seconds or minutes are usually seen with metabolic diseases, vascular diseases, and malformations. Brainstem malformations often present with apnea. Neurological findings due to brainstem involvement with an initial course that advances in a matter of hours or days are likely to be produced by errors of metabolism or infectious processes. Neurological findings due to brainstem involvement with an initial course that advances in a matter of a few days or weeks are likely due to errors of metabolism, infectious process, or tumors. Neurological findings due to brain stem involvement with an initial course that advance throughout the neonatal period are likely due to errors of metabolism, infectious processes, tumors, or degenerative diseases. Neurological findings due to brainstem involvement with an unwavering initial course are likely due to malformations, but as previously stated, a disease with a relatively brief intrauterine initial course may, by the time of birth, manifest as a fixed deficit. 
Next, I will address the cerebellum. The initial course of neurological findings due to pathological processes in the cerebellum will also aid narrowing the pathological differential diagnosis. Seizures, as expected, will have a very brief initial course, usually lasting seconds or minutes. Seizures of cerebellar origin are very infrequent when compared with seizures of cerebral origin. Cerebellar vascular events will have a little longer, in most cases developing in a matter of several minutes. The initial course of neurological findings due to a cere cere cerebellar infectious process will be relatively longer, a matter of hours, but at times neurological findings due to cerebellar infections continue to deteriorate almost throughout the neonatal period. A similar situation may be seen with tumors, although the initial course tend to be a little bit slower. Neonates with cerebellar malformations usually present with unchanging severity of neurological findings throughout the neonatal period, although at times the presentation may be episodic with the actual neurological finding having a brief initial course. I will now address the spinal cord. Direct spinal cord trauma usually produces neurological findings within a brief initial course. The neurological findings due to direct spinal cord trauma usually develop in less than one minute. The spinal cord vascular accidents usually produces neurological findings that reach stability in a matter of minutes or at the most hours. Spinal cord tumors produce neurological findings that tend to progress in a matter of days or at times continue to progress throughout the neonatal period. Spinal cord malformations tend to produce a stable neurological deficit during the neonatal period. Now let us talk about lower motor neuron diseases. Errors of metabolism that involve the lower motor neurons usually produce neurological findings that progress in a matter of weeks, reaching stability by the end of the neonatal period, but occasionally they have a slower progression or even no apparent progression during the neonatal period. Degenerative diseases involving the lower motor neuron produces neurological findings that most often progress very slowly during the neonatal period or not at all. Malformations involving the lower motor neurons tend to produce neurological findings with no apparent progression during the neonatal period. As I have been saying almost every time I mention malformations, the lack of progression during extrauterine life may be the result of a stability rich neutral from a pathological condition with a brief intrauterine initial course. The next anatomical site to be considered is the nerve. When we talk about nerves, we include somatic nerves, indicated in this frame by the magenta arrow, and autonomic nerves, indicated by white arrows. Nerve trauma produces neurological findings with a brief initial course or a fixed deficit. The later situation Offers occur when trauma is in utero or during labor. The initial course of neurological finding result, resulting from autoimmune diseases tend to progress in a matter of hours or a few days. The initial course of neurological findings resulting from nerve tumors tend to progress at a slower pace. 
they do so in a matter of weeks or even continue to deteriorate during the neonatal period. The initial course of neurological findings resulting from malformations tend to be fixed throughout the neonatal period. Next site to be considered is the neuromuscular junction. The initial course of neurological findings due to autoimmune disease involving the neuromuscular junction is usually brief in a matter of seconds or minutes, usually worse, usually getting worse as the feeding progress but in other occasions they may have a longer initial course deteriorating in the course of hours. In the first case they present with apnea and in the second case with weakness. Neurological findings due to infection affecting the neuromuscular junction, that is botulism, usually present with an initial course lasting for a few hours, days, or they progress throughout the neonatal period. Neurological findings due to malformation of the neuromuscular junction may present with a brief or a protected initial course. The initial course of the neurological findings in neonates with malformation of their muscular junction may last seconds, as in apnea, or not change during the neonatal period, as it is often the case when malformations of the neuromuscular junction produces weakness or atherograde process. The final site to be considered is the muscle. Neurological findings due to muscle disease produced by errors of metabolism may have an initial course that takes place in a matter of days, but at times it may have a more prolonged initial course lasting beyond the neonatal period. Neurological findings due to muscle tumors have an initial course that take place in a matter of weeks or even advance throughout the neonatal period. Neurological findings due to muscle disease produced by degenerative processes may have an initial course that usually take place in a matter of days, but it may be more prolonged and last beyond the neonatal period. Neurological findings due to malformations of, of muscles tend not to change in the course of the first month of life. As you have seen, we have used the initial course at each anatomical location to narrow the number of pathological process, processes being considered. We can at times take this exercise a bit further by using one more filter. The last filter that we can use to limit the number of pathological processes being considered is the presence of a pre-existing condition. Certain diseases are known to affect certain anatomical sites by specific pathological mechanisms. In this frame, I have listed four conditions known to be associated with specific pathological processes at specific anatomical sites. In neonates with charge syndrome, and nerve involvement, the likely pathological process is malformation. In neonates with neurofibromatosis type 1, with nerve involvement, the likely path pathology is tumor. In neonates with hypoxic ischemic events and brain injury, the neurological findings are likely seizures. In neonates with shoulder dystocia and evidence of nerve injury, the likely cause is trauma. So now I want to go back to the initial chart to point out to you that once we have used the third step to go from anatomical localization to pathological differential diagnosis, the next step is to fabricate a list of the likely etiologies producing the neurological finding. The etiologies selected to construct this list should be based on the overall frequency of these etiologies in the neonatal period. 
As you will recall, when we introduce neurological findings and pathological processes, we said that the most important factor determining their frequency was age. So is the case with etiological conditions. Hence, as previously stated, the neurological differential diagnosis is based on the frequency of the different etiologies in relation to age. This list, similarly to the pathological differential diagnosis list, must be comprehensive, targeted, and as concise as possible. Finally, in the last step, to conclude the navigation through our chart, we choose from among those entities listed in the neurological differential diagnosis one of them. This feat is accomplished by using the same tools we used to establish the pathological differential diagnosis and the neurological differential diagnosis. The difference is just in our willingness to err for the sake of singling out one condition. Set in scientific terms, the willingness to increase specificity at the expense of sensitivity. Recall the etiological cause we choose from the neurological differential diagnosis list, the clinical neurological diagnosis. Once a clinical neurological diagnosis is made, it must be confirmed. Confirmation is achieved by laboratory, radiological, and genetic testing, but most importantly by time. Time can lead us to corroborate our clinical diagnosis by coupling the subsequent clinical evolution of the patient's neurological finding with the expected evolution of our clinical neurological diagnosis. Time can also lead us to disregard our clinical neurological diagnosis when the course of the neurological finding does not coincide with the expected course based on our clinical neurological diagnosis. So, when the etiology of the neurological finding cannot be confirmed or is disproven by the passage of time, the appropriate course of action is to go back to the order of operations, to incorporate the new information, and to try again. Now, I am going to give you one example, which consists of a vignette to show you how this algorithm works. A one month old presents with a history of left arm weakness since birth. On attempt to move his affected arm, we notice a waiter's tip posture. The severity of the weakness has not changed. Physical examination demonstrates a cutaneous lesion characterized characteristic of neurofibromatosis. The, the picture below was taken when the baby was three days of age. So we start with, uh, with the chart of the order of operations. We substitute neurological finding for arm weakness, that is the patient's complaint. We ask ourselves which is the pathway involved. By answering this question, we substitute the functional system involved in the chart by the corticospinal system. Next, we ask ourselves where is the corticospinal system involved? We go through the process we have just described for the purpose of anatomical localization. We draw from our knowledge of the trajectory of the corticospinal system from our knowledge of the different manifestation produced by involvement of the corticospinal system at different sites, in this case, the waiter's tip position of the arm would suggest 
and nerve lesion at the brachial plexus. We look for the neurological manifestations produced by involvement of other neurological systems adjacent to the trajectory of the corticospinal system. There was none in this case. Then we look for manifestations produced by the involvement of non-neurological structures adjacent to the corticospinal system. In this case, there is a cutaneous lesion just above the brachial plexus. The conclusion gained by this process leads us to the brachial plexus as the anatomical site of involvement. The brachial plexus is no more than a bunch of intermingling nerves, so we substitute anatomical localization in the chart with nerve. Next we ask ourselves what are the likely pathological processes affecting the nerve. The answer to answer this question we apply a set of filters. Based on the age of the patient, in this case neonate, neonate we go from all possible pathological processes to just those that occurred in the neonatal period. Based on the anatomical localization, in this case nerve, we reduce the number of possible pathological processes to those involving nerves. They are trauma, malformations, tumors, and autoimmune disorders. Next, based on the initial course, in this case no change is birth, we further reduce the number of possible pathologic processes to trauma, malformations, and tumors. Based on the pre-existing condition, in this case nephropharomatosis, we select tumor as being the most likely. So, the answer to what are the most likely pathological processes in this case leads to only one possible cause. So, we substitute pathological differential diagnosis by tumor. We then ask ourselves what are the most likely etiologies of nerve tumors in neonate. We answer this question based on having read about the subject or based on personal experience. I would say plexiform neurofibroma, perineuroma, or fibrolipomas. We would then ask ourselves, given that the patient has neurofibromatosis, which one is the most likely cause? The best answer to this question is plexiform neurofibroma. So, as you can see, once the algorithm is understood, maneuvering through it is an efficient and effective way to arrive to the cause of a neurological finding. Thank you.